somehow entertaining you all before you had lunch. So made it a little easier here. And why am I involved in all of this? Tony, I, I didn't get caught in the beginning that first wave. I got, I got picked up at the end. I went online in 99, and I've been online, it seems, ever since. During the meeting, I've had three students who have contacted me, one I replied to so far, and that's my life since then, and uh, for a lot of us as well who are still doing it online. Um, I'm going to give you a little insider kind of info here before I introduce the uh, panelists. These are the questions that they were asked to think about uh, for the panel, among other things we'll talk about. But there are a lot of you here in the audience, I believe, who have experience teaching online. And you might want to think about these. I don't want to overfill your plates. This is food for thought, so it will occupy a different organ of your body. We asked them, what did you find most difficult about teaching online? Are there things that are specific to your discipline that you think work particularly well in the online environment, or things that are particularly hard to convey? Do you or did you feel you had the necessary skills and support to teach online? Do you think that your college furnishes the needed supports for the faculty and students who are engaged in the online form of instruction? What forms of assessments would you recommend for the demonstration of the effectiveness of online instruction? Given that there are different teaching styles, are there faculty who are not suited for online instruction, even with an infrastructure of support for them? Given that there are different learning styles, are there students who are not suited for online instruction, even with an infrastructure of support for them? And here to uh, tell us how they responded to these and other experiences related to online is James Richardson, who's Academic Director of Communications and Media Program at CUNY SBS and Associate Professor of New Media Technology at LaGuardia. Jennifer Sparrow at the far end, we're a book, uh, what do you call book ending you, Bookended, yeah. with another <laughs> Academic Director of the School of Professional Studies, the Program in General Education and Professor of English. And in the middle, Shirley Zaragoza, business management faculty at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, and whose experience is somewhat different than the others because I don't like to say we're in the trenches, but we're in the thick of it. And you've been there, and maybe we'll again get into it, but not right now. And we'll hear why. So uh, we didn't decide in what order anybody would go, so you have any preference? Anybody really burning to get out the answers to those questions? Jennifer has a plane to catch. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Jennifer. Oh, I didn't know we were going to answer all of the questions at once. Um, no, 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 not necessarily. Any old thing. Um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges, it was also one of the things that I really liked and found fun, but it was also difficult, is the challenge of, of faculty building online courses. And um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot because I, I started out, I guess I was maybe the second wave. I, I, I started um, teaching online because of the Sloan program. And going through that program helped me to build a course. And it was really, um, but outside of Sloan, I didn't really have a lot of other support. It was just kind of a labor of love. And I was feeling my way along and figuring, out, figuring things out as I went along. Um, and I guess the best thing about it was that the students were just kind of into it, and the students were very patient. So they, uh, I remember really fondly one English class where I, it, it, it was meant to be just a face-to-face -face class, but I told them I'm, I want to make an online course, and so would you guys go along with me, and I'm going to try out some of my online assignments on you. And um, they were really, it was a really great class and really supportive, and they actually gave me a plaque at the end of the class um, <laughs> saying I went above and beyond. So that's a really happy memory of, um, of online teaching for me. Um, and so now in addition to teaching, I'm overseeing the general education program at, um, at CUNY SPS. And what I think, the, the biggest challenge I'm facing right now and what I think is hard for instructors is, is support in, in building a course because uh, faculty have disciplinary expertise and they may have an interest in technology but then at least at SPS we are stuck using Blackboard so they really need to also become Blackboard experts or they need to become experts in things like sizing images to put in their courses or figuring out how to make the fonts all consistent which is 
a nightmare. Um, and so that's a piece of it that I, um, that I think is a real challenge for faculty and where I, I think that we could do more to support them. Um, let, let faculty, you know, design the course, select the readings, um, think of, you know, there's different kinds of assignments. It'd be nice to have someone to bounce that idea off of what, this is what I want to do, what would be a good assignment. Um, but, but help or, or provide support to do these other kind of things, like making sure links work, things that they're tedious but they're not trivial because they can really affect the student learning experience. So um, that's, a, that's a challenge that I, that I see. And then on, on the flip side of that is that I'm sure that all faculty constantly are getting, I know I am bombarded by uh, publishers who say, oh, here, here's, here's a product, here's an online class, here's a course in the box. And so there's that tension that it would be very easy to teach an online course if you just want to let Pearson design it for you or let Macmillan design it for you. But then I think if we do that, we're losing one of the best things about teaching online, which is that we can make it less expensive for our students by providing access to open source materials. Um, if, a, if a student uses a course that, a Pearson course, they're probably going to have to pay at least $100 for access to the, to the course. Um, so I'll stop now and let somebody else speak on that if you'd like. Sure, I'll go. I, I always talk a lot anyway. Uh, I'll jump on to some of what Jennifer said in terms of uh, one of the most difficult things for me is also kind of course design. But I, I look at it from a little bit different perspective. Uh, the, the issue in terms of the student experience, in terms of, of navigation, students being able to easily figure out the, 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 the layout of the course. Uh, and let me back up. I'm on a task force at SPS for uh, retention. Uh, and one of the things that we notice is that, you know, usually if you get students through that first year, that first semester or so, there's a good chance that they'll stay. When we usually start seeing students drop out as that initial kind of, from an online education, is that initial semester when they come on and they're trying to figure out working in an online environment, figuring out where things reside. And those are some of the issues that I think we can resolve if um, we consolidate and, and, and make the course structures a little bit more consistent throughout uh, to take that initial barrier away, any type of technological hurdle in terms of where information sits, where uh, assignments are basically need to be submitted because they have to learn Blackboard or whatever course management system that they're using as well. And this is also the same with faculty. Uh, if we can remove that initial barrier I usually see that at least the beginning courses usually start off much smoother. Uh, that's one of the challenges. Okay. Um, um, one of the other things that, uh, that's most difficult is just basically time management. Getting faculty and students used to teaching in an online environment. Uh, it's different. This is one of the reasons why uh, Susan, Susan Coe and her, her group have uh, the training that they provide before faculty are actually able to teach for SBS is, is critical um, because teaching in an online environment is very different. The time management issues, the responsiveness that you have to basically uh, or respond to student uh, requests, um, it, it's much more intensive. And I think students and faculty both have that initial thought that learning or teaching in an online environment is easy, um, and it's not. It's, I think, in many ways much more difficult. Shirley. I, I want to say that I really enjoyed the uh, teaching of online courses, but uh, I have a course, uh, Introduction to Business and Introduction to Finance, and Introduction to Finance was my online course, and uh, it has quantitative uh, parts to the course, which makes it more challenging for my students. Uh, or maybe make more challenging in general when uh, mathematical computations are added to the online curriculum. And therefore, um, our attrition rate is different than other courses. And unfortunately, we're compared to other courses, and that presents a problem. So for us, um, mathematical computations um, is a challenge on site. And it's, you know, it 
it's exaggerated when it's online. So uh, you can see why our numbers may be conflicted with other courses, but that isn't taken into account when we're being evaluated and compared with other courses and therefore provides a challenge for us. Um, I no longer teach online because of that. My numbers were not coming in in the same way that other course numbers were coming in and therefore I was being given uh, a high level of scrutiny. And, and, and no one in my department has taken on the challenge to reintroduce this course because of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I want you to uh, realize uh, there is the, uh, the challenging side. As much as I loved it, and I was one of the courses, um, I think actually the lead course that was picked up during Hurricane Katrina. And uh, my course was in demand. And it was successful because I had students uh, that were um, quite high level, um, most of which came from Tulane. And it was very exciting. They were committed to the quantitative as well as the qualitative information that was being shared. I teach Introduction to Finance. And it was an exciting semester. I really enjoyed teaching it, but just like my on-site classes, we do not compete on the same level with other courses because we have the quantitative factors that are involved, and therefore, we may have a different attrition rate and yet we are being compared on an equal platform with our other courses. So that has been a challenge, uh, was my challenge, and um, when I was confronted with that, it, uh, it left me no choice but to move on and not to teach online, and has not been picked up since. Can, Let I, ask, can I ask a question on that? Yes, sir. Because uh, that kind of dovetails into the next series of questions. Are there? Do you think that there's specific disciplines that work better in an online environment than others? Well, if you have a course that has a higher attrition rate on site, it's obvious that you are going to continue that challenge online. So you can't be given the same numerical uh, parallels with the other courses when you um, have a higher attrition rate even on site. So the parallels were not fair, and I would say to administrators, you have to consider that. Uh, and my course and those who had taken it and that were successful with it were extremely happy with it. I was so happy when we picked up students from Hurricane Katrina, and I got to know students from all over the country. It was a wonderful experience, but um, I was given a hard time when the numbers weren't coming in compared to the other courses. Let me bring together a couple of things. Manfred Philip, I believe, wrote it up during the Q&A in a previous session with this seed question about assessment. I'd like each of you to comment on how you think the individual faculty member with the faculty's goals assesses how well they do in their course online. with and comment on how their evaluators, whether it's an observer or the chair of their department, should assess how well they're doing. Because that's at the heart of your issue right here, right? So each of you comment from the instructor's point of view, what's assessment going to count the most? And from anyone evaluating them, what kind of assessments should be done? Well, from the instructor's point of view, um, I'm always looking at, of course, how are students doing on, on doing on assignments? What is my overall performance in the class? Um, what assignment seems to be particularly challenging or something where I get a whole bunch of questions on it and then it, it's a flag to me that, that something's wrong and I need to go back and reevaluate it. Uh, at the end of the semester, I always like to ask the students um, anonymously uh, to write a letter to their successors to say what what do they know at the end of the class that they'd like to share with the next cohort of students coming in? And also, if they have anything for me, you know, any kind of recommendation for me to change the course, which I've always found very helpful because I always get some 
tip from the students that I hadn't thought of before um, that helps me make the course better. Uh, in terms of evaluating the professor, in terms of sort of the, the, the peer observation, I guess, is what you're thinking about. We, at SPS, we do have a, a peer observation form and a peer observation process. And as much as, to the extent that it's possible, we've tried to structure it just uh, as it's stated in the contract, that the person being observed would enroll the observer in the course with uh, 24 hours notice. Um, we have two different options for that. Some people prefer to give kind of a guided tour with both people on the telephone and kind of talking their way through the observation form. Um, another, the other way of doing it is just to say, okay, I'm going to be in your course on Wednesday and to sort of look around and, and our form has got different categories, um, instructor presence, um, assignments, assessments, and things like that. And so the observer would just go through and, you know, check off. Uh, we have three, I think, I can't remember, but three different categories, needs improvement, acceptable or outstanding or something like that, and then make comments. And speaking as a person who's done a lot of observations, one of the things I find is that perhaps I'm just not seeing something on my, if I'm doing it myself and not being walked through it, I might miss something. And so usually what I advise people to do is to you know, write something down and say, I don't see this, and I flag it, because then when we have the post-observation conference, which is done by telephone or by Skype, um, those things can be clarified. So it's, it's an observation, a conversation, and then a, a revision of the form, which goes back to the person being observed. Uh, there are some things, um, I was thinking about the, the question about our faculty forced to do certain things, um, you know, do they have to use a certain platform or use certain tools? Uh, at, at our school, we're fully online and they do have to use Blackboard because the students want a, they, they want a consistent environment. They, they, time and time again in feedback, they ask for more consistency in course sites and they, they balk at learning, you know, ePortfolio and, th and things like that. Um, so not that I want to totally be a slave to the students, but I want to be respectful of their desire not to have the technology get in the way of the learning. Um, and, and we are looking for instructor presence in the course site. So I, when I'm doing an observation, I want to see some sign that the professor is there. Um, is he making announcements each week? Is he on the discussion board responding to students and guiding the conversation? Uh, do I see feedback um, to the students on their assignments? So to some extent, we are saying, yes, we want you to use the discussion board and we want you to be there in the class, but um, you know, this is a fully online environment, and so you know, if, you, if it's a face-to-face -face course, you want the teacher in the classroom, and that's how the teacher is there. I guess I'll go. Um, I'll dovetail once again off of what some of what Jennifer says. We're both at the same place. Uh, one of the things from assessment standpoint, I think that um, just as how we do it at SBS um, and comparing that against face-to-face uh, -face assessments that I've done at the community college that I teach at LaGuardia, uh, the assessments I think on the, in the online arena are, are much more intense. Uh, I think you have a better idea of the, the, the entire scope of the course. You get to see student engagement, you get to see faculty engagement, not only for that one brief period, but you'll see what they've basically been doing throughout the course. Uh, I usually do a two-prong when I do an assessment for faculty. I look at, uh, I'll go in, I'll have, you know, look at the site, look at the, uh, the discussion board, I'll look at the individual prompts that faculty have basically given, what's the, re the engagement with the students, with the assignments that the prompts have, have hopefully spark, uh, what type of uh, feedback does the instructor give to the students over the course of the discussion board, which is pretty extensive in most cases, much more extensive than when actually I have to do uh, an evaluation of someone tomorrow out at LaGuardia. I'm going out on a Saturday. And you basically sit there for one class and you observe them. Now, you know, the, the, the devious pirate because I'm an online pirate, you know, I'm always thinking about ways to beat the system. I mean, you could conceivably have a faculty member who be, who's absolutely horrible who will pull out that one good lecture <laughs> that he has or that one good day and actually teach. 
that's a lot harder to hide in an online environment and a discussion board session because you see over a period of time what they've been doing. So from an assessment standpoint, when I hear people kind of balk, well, you know, how are we going to assess online, you know, education? In many ways, if it's done correctly, it's way more intensive. Um, so um, I know I'm a little bit off topic, but um, from, from a faculty standpoint, what instructors generally, you know, what I'm hoping that my instructors are, are, are looking to do is that level of engagement. And this is when I went back before talking about having faculty understand that teaching in an online environment is not the same as, you know, I'm going to have my coffee, I'm going to sit in my bathrobe, and I can just, <laughs> you know, leisurely interact with students. No. The amount of back and forth, the number of emails, the number of, you know, even outside of Blackboard, sometimes the, the, there's a lot of conversation that takes place. It's far more intensive, far more intensive. So um, I, I think the, the whole idea of assessment in online, it, when, once you really kind of pull the curtain back and you look at what happens, um, I, I, I hope it will dispel some of the fear, agita, or whatever it may be, in terms of um, it being uh, effective. James, as an online instructor yourself, what about your self-assessment? <laughs> uh, well, I'm always hard on myself. Um, what do you mean exactly? How do you determine at the end of the semester whether it's been a successful semester with this online class of yours? Well, for me, it's I, I, a lot of the projects when I teach online, a lot of the projects that I teach are, are project-based. Um, there's discussions, but students have to basically create something. So for me, with my discipline, communication and media, digital media in general, you know, the final assessment is did they finish the project. Um, if they were able to complete this, if it was, you know, if the programming worked effectively, if the layout was efficient, if the, the, the model that I'm asking them to design is, is effective, it's inherent. Um, so I think I have a little bit of a benefit, and this is what I was asking you, Shirley, about certain disciplines being maybe more or less suited to an online environment. A lot of the technical stuff that I like where it's project-based I think is absolutely great because they have to, from an assessment standpoint, they, when they complete the project, it's there. Um, either it worked or it didn't. Um, in terms of online discussion, in terms of knowing whether or not um, students have picked up some of the more theoretical aspects of it, um, it's the amount of engagement. It's the, for me, it's a, like how engaged are the students? What type of questions are they asking? Are they asking the right questions? Or is it just, uh, you know, what is the quality of the conversation? That's how I basically in, uh, determine whether or not I've taught that particular class effectively. I'll ask each of you to respond to this in face-to-face -face setting uh, is okay as well as online. Uh, the claim that an instructor will learn most how to become a better instructor by receiving instruction from the students that instructor has just attempted to teach. Uh, you've already indicated, Jennifer, you ask of some. What about the other two? Because I know everything I learned that works, I was taught by my students. <laughs> they also taught me what didn't work. You want to take that one, Shirley? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, uh, online teaching is so much more interactive because each person has a voice. You hear each person, and if they don't speak out, you don't see them. So uh, this, your statement is so much more vivid online because uh, the amount of participation and back and forth, the, the volleyball game, let's say, um, is definitely there. And if you're not on the other side of the volleyball game, the rally's not happening. And uh, so online education is uh, extremely accountable and one that uh, is communicative, interactive. But what happens is that if you don't have students who are playing on the one side, then you're not able to have that rally. And 
online education requires that rally to happen. And so we weed out those students very early that they're not into the game, they're not playing. And I can't interact with someone who's not there. So there's a lot of responsibility on, on the student to make sure their visibility is there. And therefore, uh, the online educational process is an extremely rewarding one. But I think what happens is that uh, some students have a misinterpretation uh, of taking online courses, and they don't realize how uh, invested they need to be. And therefore, we weed out those students very quickly, but unfortunately, that falls on the instructor too often. And we are being uh, evaluated on that level when it's usually the student isn't ready for the commitment. But for those who are, it's an extremely valuable, interactive experience, one that I enjoyed tremendously, but uh, with the evaluation process the way it was, um, I, I wasn't able to continue. Um, this, is a, it, this was not my own idea, so I can't take credit for it, but another really neat um, way of, of an instructor evaluating how her course was going and what her students learned, and this was in, um, this is in a course called Math and Contemporary Society, so it's kind of a practical application of mathematics, and it's a totally online course. And this instructor had the idea of taking the, the course learning outcomes. She wanted to make sure the students really understood what they were supposed to be learning. And she asked the students to make um, videos saying, what was the learning outcome, um, provide an example of it, and then also to connect the learning outcome to the workplace, something that they were doing at work or at home. And uh, she got some really nice videos of this, and they, they were so creative. A student who, who worked at uh, conferences and had to set up her booths, and so she was talking about how she had to use math to figure out you know, the, the number of supplies that she would need to bring with her. So I thought that was, especially in math, which, like you said, it's so difficult, um, and it can be so impersonal. It was really great, and the students enjoyed getting to hear and see their, their classmates, too. So I thought that was a really creative assessment. George Adi touched on one of the C questions toward the end of his presentation when he indicated very briefly that perhaps there are some instructors who should not consider going online. <laughs> in your experience, has that occurred to you, and in what way? Um, yeah. Um, how can I put this diplomatically? Um, uh, I'm tenured now, so I don't care, right? <laughs> uh, there are definitely some instructors who are not suited to teach in the online environment. And the ones I will generally t say that aren't are the ones who are inflexible, who have gotten used to teaching in a certain way. Um, I'm a technologist, so just on a, on a professional standpoint, that rubs me the wrong way because Technology constantly changes, and if I'm going to stay relevant, I have to constantly go back and keep learning. And I expect all of my instructors, to a large extent, to hopefully have that same type of mindset. Um, I don't know everything. They don't know everything. There's no one who does. As things start to evolve, I'm hoping that people keep an open mind and are, are, are experimental, willing to at least entertain the possibility that there may be a different way or a better way or just maybe a more current way of doing things. So the, the faculty that I usually have issues with are generally the ones who, well, I've been teaching this course for the last six years or eight years or whatever, and this is in an online or an offline setting. Uh, and it's always worked this way. Why can't we continue? The, the issues that I usually have are, Students are different now, you know. Uh, the way my son learns things, the way my daughter learns things is radically different than the way I learned things back then. They're much more visual. Um, so to a certain extent, we have to engage students in the ways that they learn and be open to realizing that there's just not one playbook that we always have to stick to. I'm, I'm all for consistency. I'm all for 
making sure that, you know, we do maintain standards without a doubt. But there may be times when, you know, experimentation is not a bad thing. And um, faculty are usually hesitant towards any type of change or they're usually the ones I have the most issue with. The other thing is faculty who are just not technically versed and, and don't want to become technically versed, uh, which is difficult in the online environment because we're working with computers. Um, so if they're not used to working or hesitant to work with Blackboard or working with multimedia content, um, and, and th those are the ones who just, from my standpoint, probably shouldn't teach in an online setting. Before going on to the other two to answer the same question, you're echoing something Tony said. These are qualities that you look for in a face-to-face -face classroom as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I always agree with Tony. Uh, <laughs> um, but absolutely, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the online environment, from, from at least from my personal standpoint, is the, the qualities I look for for in a faculty who's teaching in a traditional classroom setting isn't that radically different than what I look for in an online and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I want faculty who are engaged, who are excited about teaching, who are experimental, willing to take risks, who are not slaves to structure and to, you know, uh, a certain pedagogy, just, you know, willing to, to step out of the box. And I think in my own practice, either online or in the classroom, that's one of the things I try to bring is I try to reach the students in whatever avenue, whatever venue that they can be reached at. And I try not to hold just to this is the way I always did things, this is the way my mom did things, you're going to do those things as well. Well, I want to say with my experience is that um, I, was, I was a pioneer with online education at BMCC. We were uh, pioneers within CUNY. And uh, with that, I think that came with uh, some of these issues of adoption of innovation. And I think some of the administrators, uh, you know, were using tools that were um, aligned with uh, adoption of courses, but not realizing that online courses was uh, a different entity in itself. So uh, administrators had to understand this, but since it was pretty new when we were um, starting online courses, they didn't have the experience and background. I'm hoping by now, I have, I have, I'm no longer teaching online because of the conflict of the attrition issue, but uh, I'm hoping now administrators understand the issues of innovation, adoption rates, and the challenges that students have in terms of uh, interfacing with online courses and to uh, acknowledge the professors, acknowledge the teachers that have had long-term experience with this and realizing that uh, we get a new group of students every semester and to apply the same platform of scrutiny is, is not um, administratively correct. And so my suggestion is that you have to keep an open mind in terms of the type of students that are signing up. And I always preferred that the students be screened, scrutinized, um, educated on online course adoption, uh, and strongly understand what they're in for before they get on. Because once they sign on, the uh, attrition factor falls on the instructor. If you don't want to answer that one, I've got another one that yeah, Shirley I, just I got think into. The only person, people who don't want to teach online shouldn't teach online. Um, that's what I think about that. Okay, so then we get into what Shirley just brought up about students. Students sometimes make foolish choices, just mm -hmm. like their instructors do. And we're supposed <laughs> to advise them, thinking we're wiser than they are. What sort of students would you advise, perhaps the online mode, 
and more the totally online rather than partially online, might not at this point in their academic career be suitable to them. That you would think they're not likely to do that well. Well, that answer is very easy for me. Uh, there is an added level of commitment for an online student because they're extremely visible. And uh, we have some students uh, on site that may miss some classes, and then they have a certain absentee uh, acceptance rate that you're allowed. And if we were to apply that online, uh, then obviously we have the same factors as to you know, whether your attendance was there. And your attendance is clearly quantified on an online course. So it doesn't fall on the instructor to validate that the attendance or the participation wasn't there. Whereas on site, I think sometimes professors can waive the attendance or waive, it can be a little looser. But with online, it is very quantified. It's clear whether they're participating or not. So. And, and with CUNY or with, with my college, you know, there's a certain participation rate that is uh, required in order to maintain your status. So for us, it's easy, it's very easy to show and demonstrate that the student did not show the attendance rate that they needed in order to uh, continue in the course. But still, uh, we as faculty members were um, those factors were used in terms of evaluating us and our performance, and yet their attendance was not there. How do you quantify, one of the challenges I have is like, how do we quantify attendance? Is it quantified by logins to the system? Is it qualified by uh, posting assignments or responding to discussion boards? How do, how do you generally? Well, every course is different, but I had a very specific uh, participation rate on the discussion board. You have to be involved in the discussion board and your assignments had to be in every week. I mean it's easy to show visibility on the part of the students when it's an online course. So even though I had the portfolio to show my administrators that my students were not putting in the effort and therefore that played into the attrition rate, I was still uh, given you know, a, a negative association in terms of teaching, and yet I had students who were just not participating. So that's the danger with getting involved with online teaching, is because you're being blamed. Uh, your evaluation process um, is being uh, set when the participation rate wasn't there on the part of the student which is really not a fair evaluation process for the instructor. Jennifer? Uh, I think almost all students can be successful online learners. I guess when I saw this question, one example that, that did pop into my mind, and it was referred to in the, the last presentation that we saw, is the students who are so completely overbooked, and they think, well, I can take an online class because it's online. And I remember working with a student um, when I was at Medgar, and, and she, was, you know, she, she wanted to do well in the class, but she kept missing her assignments and not doing the work. And we finally sat down, and, and I said, OK, show me what you're doing in, in, in a week, or show me what you're doing in 24 hours. And literally, she had, she had no time to do this course. She didn't even hardly have time to sleep enough, much less to be taking this online course. So, it goes back to that perception that, oh, well, it's online, I can do it any time. But I finally, you know, we both came to the agreement that she had no time and she couldn't take this course. Um, the, other, the other thing I think is that's important, and it's especially for younger students, is that what I found myself is that an online course is a different relationship with, with the internet or a, dish, a different relationship with online materials. That, um, we are used to, and, and, and young people even more so, are used to really to surfing, to skimming websites, to skimming articles. I don't know about you all, but I'm still of the age where if I really want to read something well, I have to print it out. I, I just I can't seem to understand things when I, 
<laughs> really well when I look at them on the screen, but it's because I'm used to browsing and skimming and my eyes are kind of skipping around and kids are looking at Instagram. and So it's a hard thing to, to slow down and to read everything that's on the screen. So many times I've heard faculty say to me, I don't understand it. They're emailing me and asking me questions and it's right there. All they have to do is read it, but it's because I think it's because they're just used to kind of bouncing around the screen and not slowing down and, and reading what's there. So that's, I, I don't think that that would make someone unsuited for online learning, but it's, it's a kind of a retraining of the brain in how to interact with, with what you see online. SPS and Queensboro, and I think several other units of CUNY, have information and experiences available to students prior to their enrolling online self-test, suitability mm -hmm. test, how effective do you think these are in part of the preparation of a student for an online class? Well, I was, I was part of a pioneer group uh, with online teaching, and uh, I actually submitted uh, a sabbatical request uh, to make sure that we collect the data on the pioneer courses of online teaching. Uh, it wasn't accepted, but I knew that this was very important in the early days of online teaching. We really had to understand the screening process, the orientation process of bringing students onto online. The, the misconception of online uh, classes, the commitment, the involvement, the responsibility um, definitely is one that needed to be communicated very strongly on, uh, on site or online. And uh, I s continue to believe that that factor is a contributing success factor. If you really screen out the students in terms of their level of responsibility and commitment, and in many ways, this commitment is stronger than um, on site classes. It uh, puts more onus on the individual. So uh, that kind of self-responsibility is one that they have to adopt and be very clear about. And I think with a, a good screening process, an orientation process, that they learn that. Well, thank you very much. Our time is up now. And I want to thank the panelists for sharing their experiences and ideas with us. And I want you to join me in thanking Kay Conway for putting the program together. And the staff of the UFS to help out with all the arrangements. It'll be done online. <laughs> <laughs>